Welcome to my life. Brad did not do his dance today because we have Mike Stare with us. So Brad doesn't dance on days. Mike is here. It's really uh, sad. Wait, you've never, you've wait, never seen wait, the dance yet, have you? I don't Mike? want to be responsible for uh, you know <laughs> holding back such a wonderful display of uh, beauty. That, that is what most people call my dancing. Yeah, it's I a expect, wonderful I, display of beauty. I expected to be an outro <laughs> dance today, Brad. I can right. do that for you. Okay. So, everybody, welcome to MI Live. We are joined again by Mike Stair. Mike is a fellowship trained physical therapist, physical therapy educator, a personal trainer, and a nutritionist in the Boston area. Mike is the owner of Orthopedics Plus Physical Therapy and Spectrum Fitness Consulting. Did I get that? Got it. You got it nailed down. Oh, man. Memorized. I am on my game today. So <clears throat> for today's show, for today's on my live, Mike had emailed us and asked if we could talk about a couple topics that were all absolutely perfect. So the first one we're going to talk about is uh, we'll just jump right in with weight loss and arthritis. So, Mike, we'll just let you start and we'll keep right. going. Yeah, sounds good. Well, you know, um, I obviously work in both spaces, uh, helping people who have a lot of injuries and uh, on the other side of the business, helping people are losing, uh, are losing weight. Um, it started seeing obviously a major trend as I'm sure you guys see as well. Um, a lot of folks have both issues. They wanna lose weight, they also have arthritis. Um, I started looking and to say, is one perhaps causative of the other? And what I got very surprised is that many people know and can intuitively think that, well, I'm carrying around more weight and that can't be great for my knees. And they think of it from the mechanical view, right? The more weight I have um, chronically, it loads the joint. Um, but sometimes there's an error in that thought process because the first thing I want to clarify is that what happens when you have excess weight um, in terms of its negative effect on the joint, um, it doesn't, it happens because it's chronic, not because it's acute. So that's the biggest thing I want to clarify first, because many people think, oh yeah, all that weight can't be good. So then the logic could be, well, then I shouldn't be doing a lot of weight training or I shouldn't be doing these challenging aggressive exercises. Um, do you guys hear that at all from your clients or the folks that you've worked with? Quite pretty, a bit, yeah. Especially often. like, um, and not always just kind of resistance training, but just kind of physical activity in general. Just kind of you know repetitive motion, walking, hiking, that kind of stuff. That's yep. also kind of thrown into that conversation as well. Of like, hey, I carry all this weight. I kind of have limited exercise capacity until I lose some weight. Right, right. It's it's what I call the wear and tear hypothesis. Yep. And the logic is that the more activity I do, the more it breaks down the tissue. So therefore. If I want to preserve the tissue, I will do less activity. Yeah. Um, we know intuitively that's not true, but we also have proof showing that that there is not a linear correlation between activity and joint breakdown. Um, we've seen that in runners. Uh, they do not have a higher incidence of arthritis. People who started running did not escalate the risk of arthritis. And we're seeing that in other trends. So that's really the first point to clarify there is that um, this idea that activity uh, causes a wear and tear effect on cartilage um, or on joints not only isn't true uh, there's some uh, studies suggest that it might be protective so here's where that gets confusing then so if the idea is that we want to do more activity that's good for the joints then how can it also be true that being overweight is bad for the joints mechanically because you'd think that that adaptation that mechanical adaptation from being overweight would protect your joints. Here's the reason why that's actually consistent and shouldn't be confusing. When we lift weights, we're doing very, very short duration in relative terms, um, acute loading. Your body's response to acute loading is far different than the body's response to chronic loading. So mechanical loading from being overweight is chronic loading mechanical loading from uh, weight training is acute and, and uh, infrequent loading. That seems to be adaptive as opposed to maladaptive, which is the exposure of chronic weight. Um, and just to add on to that point, uh, by losing weight, we not only do we have all the studies showing the associations between um, excess weight and arthritis 
weight loss, less risk of arthritis, improved function or such. Um, but we have some really good mechanical um, uh, data that shows for every little bit of weight that you lose, it's significant. Um, one study showed for each kilogram of weight lost, you take 2.2 kilograms of joint reaction pressure off the patellofemoral joint, the kneecap, uh, with each step that you take. So it's not like you have to hit a certain threshold to see a benefit. Um, even small incremental weight loss can be pretty key. That, that's it's some. It's it's. Uh, it seems kind of like some of obvious. Like yeah, you're you're going to be overweight, chronic loading. It's going to cause joint pain. One of the things I've noticed is when Brad was just giving me a hard time yesterday um, from a picture that he found for a bio he needed for me <laughs> when I was 198, 198 pounds. And like, I'm five, seven, I was 198 pounds and like 10% body fat. It was the, 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 the most swole I've ever been. And, uh, he told me that I don't even lift anymore. Cause I'm like 172 pounds and <laughs> I was say 112 I was, pounds. That's pretty accurate. Yeah. Yeah. I'm 112. <laughs> and, uh, the, so I'm 172 now and I, I just started lifting again last week and, and that's probably after six months to eight months off. <clears throat> and I noticed that looking back at that, when I was one, when I, once I hit 190 and I just know this about myself, whenever I hit 190, all my joints hurt, my knees, my ankles, my hips, my back, everything starts to hurt. And now I'm 170 less muscular. And I'm having that same pain that I did when I was lifting heavy every day and I'm getting it at less body weight. Is there, my, my thought would be I'm getting it, I was getting it then at, in my 190s because of the weight. And now I'm getting it because I don't have the muscle to support the weight. Is that where that comes along? Yeah, I, I think that's um, uh, that's a pretty good analysis. You know, we tend to forget that um, muscle muscle bulk, especially at the knee, um, and depending on how you distribute your bulk, um, also um, at a paucity at your torso, just like for power lifters, you know, having a bigger, you know, torso gives them better leverage to be able to do deadlifts. Uh, the same can be said for more tissue in your hamstrings and your calves can give you a little bit more leverage in deep squats, but that's a little bit more nuanced. In terms of your case, uh, the tendon properties that um, occur from uh, getting stronger can also help with force distribution. Um, but in short, I think that's that's a, a fair analysis. To that point, though, something that's really interesting is that most of the studies, and it's because of practicality, you guys know from looking at research studies, most of the time when they're talking about obesity, they're using body weight or BMI. Um, but this one study by, I think it was Barry, 2010 to this study, and he was the first to show that the um, arthritis correlates with weight were actually more with a correlate with body fat than they were with body composition. So in your case, maybe it was because there was a relatively rapid increase in weight, maybe because mm -hmm. with that rapid increase in weight, you were using lifting more load that you were, your body had acclimated mm -hmm. to, perhaps if it happened over a more steady period of time, or maybe your joint structure. I mean, there's plenty of people who are five, seven, 200 pounds, you know, yeah. that can carry the weight. And there's other people that just have small bones that they can't carry it as well. So that might be part of it as well. But as far as that correlation, um, that was the neatest study that I've seen on this, which is they found it wasn't so much body weight in the correlate with fat mass or with uh, arthritis, but rather um, body fat. Okay. So that was the first study I've seen that made that distinction. Hmm. Interesting. And so, you know, one of the questions I would have kind of on the, you know, why we, why we see some of this mechanical loading hypothesis actually bearing out in people with obesity is, is it less on kind of the load and more of the fact that at that load, there's just never a recovery period? Yeah. And that would seem to be uh, the correlate because there unfortunately are a lot of people who are obese who aren't concurrently lifting heavy weights. Yeah. Um, so that would be the distinction. If we said that it was purely the, um, um, the heavy load, that would seem to be equally as, as prominent in, let's say, uh, people who are overweight who are strong versus people who are overweight who are not. Um, 
But I think what you suggested is probably the biggest factor. Um, that unifies all the observations I've seen, which is I've seen people who are remarkably strong, people who do um, amazing feats of uh, loading from you know impact activities, and um, the variable that tends to set them up for injury um, or or not seems to be how much um, opportunity they had to recover. Yeah. So I think recovery is probably the bigger factor than the uh, chronicity of load. Hmm. And then are there metabolic components to it as well? I mean, I think, you know, one of the things that we know, I mean, even from like a, a muscle standpoint, a bone tissue standpoint and a soft connect, like connective soft tissue, like tendons and ligaments, there are metabolic effects that occur as BMI or adiposity increases. Um, are there things that affect kind of the actual kind of joint surfaces um, and kind of what might those be if there are? Yeah, and, and that's what has really surprised me the most, the more I've been looking at this connection, um, is the assumption has always been that there's a mechanical part, but what we're learning more is that there is a, uh, a more of a physical, like bio, or not a biomechanical, more of a chemical component of this. Uh, we know um, uh, uh, adipocytes are um, a, a way, do correlate, increase adipocytes, do correlate with greater C-reactive protein. Um, interleukin factor six and one, all of those are mediators of cartilage homeostasis. And that mediation really gets faulty once we have increased body fat. Um, and to distinguish the effect of the mechanical effects from the chemical effects, um, they have seen in uh, people who are obese have a higher incidence of hand arthritis. Um, that's obviously not a weight bearing joint. Yeah. So why would there be greater cartilage breakdown in a non-weight bearing joint if it was purely a mechanical effect? <clears throat> so we've seen those inflammatory markers uh, rise proportionately to body fat. And conversely, we've seen them decrease. We know that those are mediators of cartilage uh, homeostasis and inflammation. Um, and we do see cartilage defects that are greater in those who are obese um, in, in particular in not only weight bearing, but also in non weight bearing joints. So that's a pretty convincing, um, uh, amount of evidence, um, to show that there's, there's definitely more than a mechanical effect. Um, so I, that's why I try to, uh, teach that to people who are fit and they're getting stronger and I'm encouraging that. And that's awesome. That's great. But this is a double edged sword body fat when it comes to cartilage health. Yeah. And what's been interesting. So my dad's been in uh, orthopedics for, I don't know, probably 20 ish year now. And one of the interesting things, cause I used to go as a kid and shadow him all the time. Like it was, I could go hang out in the OR and that was like the coolest thing you can do as a 12 year old. Right? <laughs> um, right. Right. And the patient demographics of people who are undergoing like total knee replacements, total hip replacements was very much kind of most of the patients probably 20, 25 years ago uh, were you know, lifelong athletes, um, you know, who had just kind of developed arthritis from 20, 30 years of running and maybe whatever the cause was, but that was kind of the primary people who were coming in for total joint replacements, right? It was kind of the, the aging, overly active people. Um, and now the demographic of people who are getting total joint replacements is probably 85 to 90% of them are obesity related arthritis. Um, yeah. And so that's one of the big complications that occurs from some of these things is total joint replacements. And then, you know, one of the questions I would have um, for you is a lot of times when we get to this place is the arthritis becomes a restrictive aspect of their life. So it, it hinders their ability to exercise um, and, and, and then to lose weight and kind of have some of those, you know, benefits from weight loss. So what are... Uh, some of the things that you can do for people who maybe, you know, do carry a substantial amount of extra adipose tissue um, and do have some movement restrictions due to arthritis. Like what are some of the things we can do to help people? 
Yeah, um, that's a phenomenal question, and that's the uh, the debate and the situation I'm in all the time. So I want to touch on two things. One, uh, there was an epidemiologist that um, had some pretty convincing data, as much as epidemiology can be, showing that um, it seems that 30% of all um, knee arthritis it can be attributed to uh, weight by itself, excess body weight. So if you think of the millions, if not billions of people that have suffered from that and the, and the monetary and suffering related to that, that is remarkable. So obviously we see that same uh, correlate in our, in our clinical work. So there's some data to prove that observation. Um, here's the biggest question I get that's related to I think what you're asking is, okay, I have severe knee arthritis and I'm overweight. Should I lose weight? and then pursue a knee surgery, like a total mm -hmm. knee replacement, or should I get the knee replacement first, which will help initiate the process of me being more active? Yeah. Um, and I think it's, um, I've learned that there is not a, I don't think a really responsible way to say one is better than the other. Um, I do know surgeons who refuse to operate until their patients lose weight. Um, I don't think that's a good strategy. I get the idea. It gives them an incentive. You know, this is serious in order to be eligible for the surgery. And there is some rationale behind that. Their outcomes probably won't be as good. The surgery is more difficult. Fitting the prosthesis is more difficult. The suture um, healing is more compromised. The risk of the surgery in itself um, are greater. Um, that being said, as you mentioned, I have seen many, many people who are able and willing to are willing to move. Um, and it's so defeating and it's so painful and they can't sleep. Um, everything they try to do is so darn painful that that's all they think about. And to say, well, you just have to go through the extra pain, I mean, emotionally, of going through an 80, 100 pound weight loss, I don't think that's really very right, to be honest. I, I, I just think that's not a good way to treat people. Um, that being said, if you're like a runner um, or a skier, and you're maybe 50 pounds overweight, um, your knees are are sore, but it's not keeping you up at night and keep you from going up and down the stairs. I would say, yeah, pursue weight loss by far first. But if you're that patient that's just, you know, you're, you're getting three hours sleep if you're lucky because your knees are so sore, get them replaced first, um, but don't hold the delusion that um, you're done. You need to obviously um, use weight loss as part of your treatment regimen after. Yeah. And I think that's one of the, the hard parts too, is, you know, trying to get people into a place where you can actually set them up for success um, first. And I think that's one of the hard parts of trying to manage some of these chronic conditions is we do know there's some, some lifestyle pieces. We do know there are medical pieces and how do we, how do we have kind of conversations and get people into a place where kind of everybody's set up to succeed? Um, that can kind of, you know, includes the the patient, the medical care team, the families, the kind of the whole shebang. Yeah. And, you know, I, I kind of painted two relative extremes too to ponder, you know, that person with extreme uh, knee pain. I think that's relatively obvious, although those hard and fast rules, sometimes uh, those patients get lost in that or the athlete that's, you know, trying to get his knees fully pain free so he can ski. I think a lot of people are in that. I'd rather not do the surgery. Is there something else I could try? And I'm really, you know, anxious to lose weight um, and they want to move and they want to exercise and they can do some exercise, but the traditional idea is like go out and walk or, um, you know, just go ahead and start hitting the weights or go to a class. If there's anything that will escalate your process of um, it's time for me to exercise, I'm overweight, I got bad knees, let me go to a class, that's it. You'll mm -hmm. be uh, miserable in, in surgery a lot quicker. Um, it has to be dosed and graded and individualized. I do have people come in doing squats, um, doing step ups, and um, many people avoiding surgery, delaying it for three to five years. I, I have countless stories of that happening because we showed them how to get stronger um, without overloading their joint. We found that Goldilocks zone. Um, we can get into this philosophy a little bit more you know, down the road, but in short, let's say you have somebody who's 250 pounds and just getting on and off a chair is painful for their knees. Yeah. Um, you don't want to relegate them to doing leg raises, you know, and ankle, you know, pumps. Um, 
so one thing we've done is we've had them in a harness here in the clinic that has uh we may put 60 pounds on the harness it deloads them yeah so that now their cumulative weight is you know far less it's kind of like doing squats in a pool versus being on land or like doing a gravitron to learn how to do pull-ups right yep. you know you start with a certain percentage of your body weight and move it up that has been one of the most uh effective strategies to get people loading and moving not so much that it aggravates the infl inflammation the pain not so little that it's not enough to give them any physiological challenge and um uh, that's also pretty empowering for people because they see that there's more they can do than they thought. Um, so there's a lot of people in that middle ground that we've been able to help. And uh, I always tell them the worst outcome is you're going to be in better shape and you're going to go into that surgery, you know, a lot more confident. Um, the best outcome or, or yeah, that, the worst outcome, the best outcome is they're not going to need the surgery. They regain function and maybe they push it off for, you know, their three, four or five years. Yeah. And then from surgical perspectives, um, you know, when we talk about arthritis, what are the surgical options for people and what are the outcomes? Like how, how much benefit do people get from that? Yeah. yeah so um, I'll go from um, least beneficial to, to most. Um, the most common scenarios we see are people are told, well, we're just going to scope that. We're just going to clear out some of the arthritis. We don't see that in New England anymore. When I travel throughout the country, I still, uh, when I do seminars, I still hear clinicians um, giving stories about that. It's no longer covered by most major insurances because the evidence is not even debatable. It's very clear it doesn't work um, for that purpose. Um, the next will be um, some type of uh, uh, hemi um, uh, replacement. So they'll replace either the medial or the lateral component. Um, and we see that sometimes one side of the joint looks fine. The other side looks disproportionately damaged. Um, in my personal experience, I don't have any evidence. Um, I have yet to see anyone have a great outcome uh, that comes even close to as good as the outcomes as our total knee patients get. Um, my personal advice is that if you're going to get a replacement, get the whole thing replaced, um, getting it partially replaced, can be a problem for two reasons. One, I just don't see great outcomes. And two, you're going to have two surgeries eventually now. Yeah. Um, total knees do amazing. Um, I can count on one hand the amount of total knees that didn't do amazing. And those were people that just simply didn't have good follow through care. Um, there was one case of not having the proper size. Um, so it's a great procedure. Um, it's done very, very well by. Um, you know, majority competent uh, orthopedics, which is the majority of them. And uh, the rehab is not fun for about eight weeks. And after that, you get a taste of why you had it done. And then, you know, after several months, you're feeling pretty darn good if you do the right rehab. So it's a very strong, good, viable option that I don't want to scare people from. Um, but I hope I did scare people away from orthoscopic debridement because, um, you know, it, it hasn't shown to be very effective at all. And, and so if somebody, you know, let's say they're kind of in their, you know, late thirties, early forties, and they have some knee arthritis, that's actually giving them some substantial level of discomfort and kind of changing their quality of life. Is that too young for somebody to consider a total knee replacement or are there surgical steps before, you know, replacing bone surfaces? Uh, well, to the first part, no, it's not. The youngest I've seen is 28. Oh my um, God. And that happened due to uh, graft host, host disease. Uh, okay. They had cancer. Their um, own body essentially attacked their own joints as part of the side effect of that. Um, and uh, and they had to have early joint replacements. Another was an extreme case of uh, ehlers dollars syndrome, um, a hypermobility disorder that can cause um, havoc on many joints. Um, so I would not say universally it's too young. Um, for the majority of people, though, um, that is a relative extreme approach. Almost every case, we can look at their mechanics with how they're moving. Um, we can look at a disproportionate amount of loading relative to rest and recovery as, a, as an issue. Um, and, and weight is another issue. Usually when we address those three factors, um, things dramatically improve. Um, if they're not somebody that had some rare pathology, 
um, or some type of extreme trauma from perhaps a car accident when they're 20 and now they're getting to be 40. Um, you know, I think it's far better option to get it done when you're 35, 40 than to have the crippling effects of disability and inactivity um, add up. And then now you're in your mid fifties and if you make it there and um, you know, you still have to undergo the surgery. So. Um, and what is the, what's the longevity of a prosthetic, like a, a total knee replacement? You know, I, I don't know. And I don't know if we have any great data on that. Uh, back in the 90s, when, you know, I started in, in therapy in the late 90s, early 2000s, the studies were, uh, and the anecdotes from the uh, manufacturers, from the, uh, from the surgeons were usually saying about 20 years. Yeah. Um, it's, it was still a relatively new procedure. Now it's been, you know, that uh, long and more. And uh, I don't think there still is a great consensus on how long it lasts. Um, so, you know, most are still adhering to that 20, you know, 30. So if you get it in your 40s, um, you're going to get your knee replaced when you're still relatively young if that prosthesis doesn't last. Yeah. And I think at least from when I worked in the orthopedic field for a while, and at least from what I can recall from all the like... Uh, studies that have been done on the components generally i think the failure is not at the like component piece but the bone component interface. yeah yeah kind of that biological interface right there yeah it was worse at the hip because yeah. the hip they had two different types you know one was a, a porous metal poly or yeah, yeah exactly and the and the, one of the biggest problems they're having was the cement yeah. The cement, would, it, it wasn't the prosthesis itself. The titanium was going to be there until the end of time. It was either something was happening to the bone itself, the density of the bone, or the um, uh, the adhesives. Um, that's greatly improved at the hip. Um, at the knee, it's a little bit more mechanical. Um, I, But in my career, I haven't seen a case uh, of, a, uh, of a revision that wasn't due to a secondary problem. The revision was due to an infection. Um, yeah. in every case, or in one case it was because they learned they put the wrong side of the prosthesis in. That's a problem. <laughs> That's a big problem. Yeah. Yeah. And a big problem for everybody. So, yeah. um, I haven't seen one fail yet. Um, so I don't know if we have the data yet on that. Yeah. That's, that'll be very interesting. Right. And then from hips and knees, at least from what I know is hip recovery is generally a lot faster than knee recovery. Yeah, especially now they're starting to do an anterior approach. So what they used to do is cut right through the side and you had to go through the medius and the minimus and the, you know, uh, the lateral abduction, you know, was just so damaged and took so long to recover from. Then there were concerns about how quickly can we load the hip because of the different types of, uh, um, bone union that uh, was done to the surgery. That's pretty much gone. Even hip precautions. I don't know if you guys ever heard of those, but they used to worry about people dislocating their hip. Um, they found those to be uh, no longer necessary. In fact, could be restrictive of improving function. So total hips do, and especially the anterior approach. I have a physician who I just discharged. Um, he had two hips done this year. One at the January, another uh, right before COVID. Um, he's hiking, he's biking, he's weightlifting, lunging, you know, all those things, uh, pain-free, um, no problem. So a uh, lot of stories like that. Uh, the knee is harder because it's a hinge that has to bend a lot more. And getting that range of motion is brutal for a lot of people. I bet. <clears throat> that would be, yeah. Just imagine somebody taking part of your bone out and putting metal in and then trying to <laughs> get back on it would be it it's crazy that they can get those patients back up and walking like the, the day of their hip replacement. That's the yeah, same it's, day, it's yeah. Nuts. I'd be like, I'm just gonna lay here for about a month before I try to do anything like that. Have you guys yeah, don't touch have me. you guys Goodbye. seen Give the computer help. simulations of what the surgery looks like? I haven't seen the computer simulations. I've seen, I don't know, probably a hundred plus like in person, but um, I haven't seen the computer simulations. I, I like the computer simulations a little bit more. I've seen the in-person ones as well, but you know, it's, 
because of it's hard to get your face in there as, as much when you're observing the surgery. Yeah. But when you see it from like bird's eye view, it is pure carpentry. I mean, it is amazing. I mean, you've mm. seen it, you know, in person, you know, Brad, but just the hammering, what they remove, what they put the in, <laughs> it is, it's miraculous that they're functional and moving around after that. But then again, if you see what it looks like, it's, it's actually not too surprising that they can weight bear right away because that structure is stronger than it was before. Yeah. You know, when our patients that get the ORIFs where they get the metal plates put in, um, I always tell them, you don't have to worry about the bone going anywhere. That thing's, you know, reinforced with titanium now. Yeah. It's all the soft tissue that you have to rehab from. Yeah. That's the crazy part is you replace like fairly fragile tissue with indestructible tissue, essentially yeah. the, the bone. Yeah. yeah. Um, any other, any other thoughts before we jump into questions, Jay? I think we have a few questions on. Yeah. Here. No, I was just going to say we have some questions. Cool. Cool. All right. So Amber said, is it true that collagen can help delay onset of arthritis? Um, all right, so are you, are you talking about a collagen supplement? I'm talking. I'm, I'm assuming she means a collagen protein. Yeah, a collagen protein. Um, I haven't seen great data on this, although it's coming out relatively uh, quickly. Uh, Brad, have you seen much data on on that and any evidence? I haven't seen anything on the delay of onset of arthritis. I've seen data on collagen on other aspects, um, but not on that specifically. And I'm guessing the reason that there is no data is looking at delay of onset of arthritis is a very long-term study. So you'd have to follow people on a collagen supplement for quite a long time. Yeah. Yeah. I have, I haven't seen any myself either. So it's hard to, hard to say. Yeah. Um, okay. so we have literally no, no idea. idea. <laughs> <laughs> that's our, um, yeah. that's our highly paid educated guess. My yeah. comment um, was there. Brad and Jay have very different ideas of what the coolest thing a 12 year old can do. <laughs> I mean, I mean now keep in mind, I have a 12 year old. So, yeah, I mean, to, to be fair, I was going to work with my, I was just, my work with going to, my dad was either going to the firehouse of my dad when I was 12. He threw me and brought me, we'll go with brought, brought me into a house fire underneath his bunker coat. Didn't give me a mask, nothing, just walked me around, opened up, let me see, and then walked back. I coughed for three weeks. Um, and then my stepdad brought me to the police department and let me put handcuffs on somebody he was arresting. <laughs> Well, that's yeah. exciting. Yeah, that's awesome. And that, there's, yeah, there's looking no way that's gone wrong. This this yeah, look, so looking much. back now, like, wait, <laughs> wait, what? I believe we also went shooting under the 294 expressway with a rifle and like three cops. So, well, there you well, go. Well, that would be a normal day in the uh, Chicago area. It, yeah, 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 yeah. But just like I under, underneath the expressway, just shooting guns like with a bunch of cops. Like, okay. Um, Joan said, what are your thoughts of two knee replacements done simultaneously? My husband is 55 years old. Um, I think it is a great idea. Um, every single time I've seen somebody do it, um, they have done better than somebody who's just had one. And one of the reasons why is that you literally don't have a knee to compensate with. The compensation factor is huge. The instinct to not use it is huge. When you have both in the same boat, um, you don't have that that option. Plus, um, you know, you're getting, you know, two birds with one stone. It's a big disruptor in your life. You have to take time off of work. You have to get people to help you around the house. Uh, this allows you to do that. If his health is not great, though, if he has diabetes, if he has cardiovascular issues, uh, I'm sure this has already been screened. Um, I significantly overweight, um, not in the best of health. I would not recommend that because it's fairly traumatic on the body. Um, one surgeon I've worked with joked that he prefers doing that because um, if they did it, they would never get the second one done. Um, That's why. You know, every case is different, but as far as objectively from what I've seen from my uh, my patients, uh, the ones that have done that have all been uh, great outcomes and they've been happy that they've done. It. Yeah. And from working on working in ERs and on ambulance and stuff, I can tell you everybody I've ever <clears throat> any patient I've ever met that's ever had, you know, called 911 for pain or been in an ER for pain or a fall after a, a, a knee replacement. It's always they've always the comment is to him i should have done both at the same time i've heard that i i can't tell you how many times i've heard i should have just done them both i shouldn't have done one or the other my father-in-law is on his third knee replacement because one of them they put in 
on his left knee and it was too t- it was tight and there was a recall on the replacement the v it was some it was a, a joint that the va almost used exclusively had it replaced it didn't he had severe pain at all times um so he had it replaced and it's 10 times better but I, he had each one he had three separate knee surgeries and he said after his after the first one he said oh i should have just had done both at the same time this is horrible had the other had the left one done and then had to have the left one done again and he said well can you just replace the right one because you put the recalled one in that one too and they said no because you don't have pain uh yet oh man yeah Brutal. yeah no thanks no. i used to the guy who taught me how to lift uh he's a, a a retired bodybuilder and he's at 42 he had his right hip replaced and at 44 he had his left hip replaced and and I, I don't even know if they will do hip placements hip replacements at the same time i don't know if that would happen but that was the number one thing he said he's like i wish i could have just done both of them at the same time uh because yeah. he was just mad because he lost weight on a squat but <laughs> but he did go back i mean he went back to squat and i'm i'm pretty sure he went back to exactly where he was within two years was didn't look like he missed a beat wow yeah i mean maybe not the smartest thing because we know how you got there in the first place but yeah i know he, he still... was like ronnie coleman though doing that you know just That's stupid what I was thinking stuff. Of. Yeah. yeah so our next topic everybody ready everybody excited Absolutely. i'm 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 ready for that mike i got i got you have put this Let's in my head it. and i am positive that now i have why is this not showing a meniscus tear because you got in my head and it's just my left knee. Everybody yeah. has one, Jay. Yeah, I know. That's why it's in my head. But now I have pain. Yeah. Well, let's so, just do a above the knee amputation and call it good. I was going to say that that might be a more sufficient way. My wife would probably like it because I'd stop complaining. <laughs> I mean, I complain when I sleep. I complain when I sit. So for me, my meniscus tear, it hurts. When I put my right ankle over my left leg and sit like in a triangle with my legs in a triangle. Yeah. You know what I'm talking about? In yeah. a chair. No pain. I can. I have full flexibility. When I do it with my left, and I'm doing it right now, I can't even complete the triangle. And my left knee, instead of instead of my legs going like this, it has yeah. to go like this all the way up because I have excruciating pain in my left knee. Ouch. Yeah. So I think I have meniscus tear. It's all your fault. Yeah. I, I sometimes the power of suggestion is what. Uh, <laughs> that's the powers I have. Yeah. You know, um, yeah, meniscus stuff. Uh, it, it's really, really tricky. Um, I'll I'll kind of work backwards on it. Um, as you know, Brad was kind of joking. He's not actually too far off. Um, there is uh, a lot of data showing the prevalence of or the high prevalence of meniscal tears in asymptomatic people. I think we talked about this, you know, before Jay. So, um, so it is something that happens. The question is when they do become symptomatic. Um, first of all we have to consider is it because of the meniscus um it may be that there's a torn meniscus and you're symptomatic and the two aren't aren't correlated um that is a very reasonable uh potential there could be a you know defect in one of the ligaments it could be some swelling could be a uh, posterior uh, popliteal cyst um whole host of mechanisms could just be you know tissues mad because of you know overuse or too much activity relative to recovery um but the question is what to do about that is there a surgical option um there is a boatload of data that looks into this and they the nice thing about the surgical data on this is that most of it compares non-surgical treatment so we can have a a a good control and a lot of it also uh, actually two of the studies one that just came out they look at not only what was the results at six months, you know, you know, a year. Um, one of the studies, I believe it was in JAMA, um, did uh, a five-year uh, follow-up. So they had the exact same, you know, research setup. One group did surgery, another group didn't, uh, did therapy only. And they looked at the outcomes. They were relatively similar. And then they fast forward five years to see, well, did that tear progress and then become worse which i think was a really neat way to look at it and they found same thing five years later there was no difference um this more recent study that just came out um i believe it was like three or four days ago um what they did is uh same thing they looked at i think it was um uh yeah 35 to 65 year year olds 
um, had painful meniscal tears and no arthritis. So their cartilage was still intact. And they did uh, my favorite research design. They did a meniscectomy on one group and they did a sham surgery on the other. So, you know, those of us not familiar with that, you just anesthetize them, poke two holes in them and do nothing and then suture them up. Um, they found that there was um, no difference in function, no difference in pain. Um, what they did find, though, is they followed up with them <clears throat> five years later. The group that went through the meniscectomy, um, there was a 13% increased risk of arthritic uh, findings that had developed. Um, so you have a significant increased risk of having arthritis um, if you didn't have it before and you get a, a meniscal uh, a meniscectomy. So that is probably the first data to confirm um, loosely what we've seen. Uh, people that had ACL reconstructions, for example, have a higher incidence of arthritis years after. Um, but this was the first one where they looked at a group of people that was had an intervention, not directly for arthritis, and they didn't have any arthritis before. Did this escalate the process? It did. Um, so that's another thing to, to be concerned about if you do try to get a meniscus repair. We don't know that it's actually causing pain. We don't have great evidence that it has better outcomes to therapy. And we do have some evidence that it might increase your risk down the road of joint arthritis. Okay. Okay. So, <laughs> so uh, I mean, his dad was I, right. I, chop I it off above the knee and just be go, done. Go, go right above the knee. Get rid of it. That's the advice. No, not at all. Uh, not at all. So when people do have, you know, structural problems, meniscal problems, I mean, I think we've talked about this a little bit before. Yeah. Um, with surgical, I mean, so it sounds like surgical intervention maybe is not really a cure-all um, and if anything it may make prognosis worse so what's kind of in your mind like what's the algorithm to work somebody through of like hey they present with knee pain um they have you know a positive mri finding of a meniscal tear like is there like a, an algorithm or some sort of way that you like work with patients to feel like okay what is the best course of action here yeah so um i kind of look at it uh one uh, you know are what are the modifiable and the non-modifiable risk factors yeah um if there's non-modifiable risk factors can we compensate for those um as far as the modifiable risk factors um usually it's uh has to do with um you know, behavioral factors and lifestyle factors so let's look at sleep and let's look at um uh, at weight um i do think those are as we mentioned we have good evidence suggests that they are at least contributing factors at worst, it's good to talk to that about any human that you are, they're trusting you to help them with their health. So I talk about that. Um, the next thing I look into loading, um, what are uh, the, what is the frequency, the intensity um, and um, of the loading relative to rest and recovery? Uh, that discussion alone is a quick discussion. The intervention is swift and the impact is usually great. Um, it's a little surprising to many of my patients because they think that my first part of the algorithm is what I'm going to do with my hands and what I'm going to do with exercise I show them. But I, I use this analogy in the past. It's like um, taking Tylenol but smacking your head against the wall. What are my headaches not working? You know, I think first you need to look at those factors and see if there's changes and modifications there. Um, next is looking at, okay, are there potential biomechanical factors that are modifiable, uh, such as uh, hip strength, which is somehow related to knee mechanics. For example, um, excess tibial torsion may be related to foot position or excess uh, femoral rotation and adduction may be related to hip strength or mechanics. Those are modifiable. They have a anywhere from a loose to a, a moderate correlation with knee issues. Um, can we work on those and impact that? Then when I go specifically into mechanics at the knee, the next factor I look at is um, the uh, range of motion. Is that a factor? And again, the, the magnitude of the load. So can they load, if, although it's only within limited range of motion, or um, are they sensitive to load no matter what the range of motion is? Make modifications there. 
because we know that when we get uh, mechanotransduction, we know the benefits of that to bone health, to cartilage health, tendon health, muscle health are high. And I don't want to deprive a, a knee of those benefits. So I try to figure out how can I get them in any way? Do we need to modify the load? Do we need to modify the range in addition to the other things I mentioned, the mechanics? Um, at the very least, the outcome I get from that is people feel less restricted. They can move. They can get good general health and exercise in. Maybe it doesn't fix their knee, but at least I get them back to moving again, back to healthy behaviors that will either indirectly or directly help their knee. Um, from there, then I try to see, okay, joint mobility, ankle mobility, and let's see if we can now um, load them to greater ranges of motion, increase the magnitude of the load. Um, and that's usually at the point where people are at, this is the most I can do for you. This is where your knee's at. Um, it may get better with time. It may stay the same, might get worse. Um, and then they make an independent decision about where they're at. Um, it's very, very rare that we get to a, a guy who's in, or girl who's in their mid thirties to forties. They don't have end stage knee arthritis. They might have some cartilage defects and some, um, meniscal injuries. Um, surgery hasn't shown to be a good outcome for it. And you get them in the right therapy and you get them in the right health behaviors, things tend to at least improve. In many cases, they get better. What <clears throat> this kind of blends in with the last thing that you want to talk about, and we're 15 minutes, so I think it might be unless spread, unless you have something to add on. Yeah, so I guess in one of the questions is you know, we we continue to see, um, in athletes, especially high profile athletes, meniscal surgeries. Mm -hmm. Um, are those primarily just for return to play? Like, you know, you have a 30 million dollar contract we have to get you back on the court. I don't really care what happens in 10 years or 20 years when you're 40. It's like, we, how can we get the, the symptoms to abate the player to get back on the field or the court? Um, how much of that do you think is driven by those decisions versus, you know, in maybe high level athletes, you know, meniscal surgeries do make sense. Yeah, that's a, that's a really, really good question. And I have been searching for that in the literature and I can't find anything on it. Um, one of the key things that, that you made a distinction on that hasn't been made in a lot of literature was the time frame. Um, sure, maybe the outcomes were the same. Um, sure, maybe the um, you know the risk are a little bit greater. But did the meniscectomy people uh, get back to function quicker? Um, did they have less pain quicker? Um, I don't see a lot of the data showing the temporal nature of that. I usually see that they looked at it six weeks and then they looked at it, you know, at, at six months. Um, maybe they got better quicker at four weeks compared to it took, you know, eight weeks for the therapy group. Um, I don't see the data on that. I haven't seen anything that compared the time frame. So if there is data on that um, or anecdotal experience on that, that would probably be the reason why. Um, they not they're not as concerned about the long term implications, and they're more worried about the temporal nature of that. But as far as I know, I don't see any data on that. Um, if it's not that, then it may just be an expectation, you know. Um, and there's a lot of cases of this in in elite rehab in in surgery where the expectations tend to govern versus what the evidence shows. Yeah. And I think that's a big one, right? Is I think a lot of people say here, oh, I have a structural problem. It needs to be solved surgically. And I think that's just how a lot of us are wired to think. Well, it, it makes yeah. sense. I mean, if you've had a big problem, um, it validates it when there's a big you know, solution. Um, nobody feels good having a big problem and give, being given a simplistic solution. Yeah. Well, just do this or just do that. It almost gives the appearance that you're minimizing it or you're not taking it seriously. Um, so I'm sensitive to that. And I get that. Uh, I, I've been injured, as you guys know, plenty of times. So um, I know what that's, that mentality is like, but um, it doesn't change, you know, what we're seeing from, uh, from the evidence. So that might be yeah, one and, of the reasons why. And, and we've talked about it before too. And <clears throat> I think that 
part of the reason people always like to go to surgery is that's where you hear, you know, athletes going, right? They, they go right to surgery. They get hurt. He's having surgery tomorrow. And then they're back on the field six months later, which is way too soon. And, you know, Derek Rose, I think is the best example of it that oh, anybody yeah. knows of this. That guy's had so many surgeries that he's come back too early. He probably shouldn't have surgery the first time. He should have taken a year or two off recovered and then just surgery, surgery, surgery. And, you know, I'm, I, I actually, I was reading something the other day, about it was a, um, a a basketball blog that a friend of mine had shared on Facebook, and it was about Derrick Rose, and they think that he this time and, and NBA players in general, and they think that this time off for all athletes and have have helped heal up so many injuries um, that these guys have had because a lot of them have extended seasons off now, um, and it'll be interesting to see what the injury rate is next season compared to the last full season they had. Yeah. Yeah. It's a big factor. And I think a good distinction too, when you mentioned that, you know, well, you see the athletes, they get hurt, they're having surgery tomorrow. There's a big difference between traumatic injuries and non-traumatic injuries. Mm -hmm. um, surgery is brilliant and has changed and saved lives, including my own, by the way, uh, because of their amazing skill for dealing with traumas. Mm -hmm. It is not a great option for pain and chronic issues. Right. Uh, total joint replacements being the exception. Um, so that's probably a really good message to, to, that you could simply, you know, repeat over and over again, chronic pain, non-traumatic injuries, not usually surgery. Mm -hmm. You've had a trauma, um, surgery can be a brilliant option. Mm -hmm. So I don't like people that get my message construed to thinking that I, I'm not a huge supporter of surgery. In fact, right. I have to push a lot of people into surgery that have undue fears about it. And again, I've, I benefited from it, uh, you know, personally. So uh, that, I think that's a really good distinction. We need to see athletes getting a uh, surgery. Yeah, I agree. And is it, is it fair to say that your <clears throat> more, uh, your position is more while you have the chronic injury, we're trying to prevent it from becoming that one movement that makes it a traumatic injury. Yep. Yep. That's, that's a big way to look at it too. Um, especially my, my middle-aged older patients, you know, fall risk, Every time I, I talk about a fall, there's usually some musculoskeletal um, impairment that um, that predicated that fall. So that's an example of uh, you know something chronic that actually led to a trauma. Oh, perfect. And I take offense to that middle age comment. I got called middle age for the first time yesterday while I was getting a haircut, <laughs> and uh, it was the most. That was probably the most traumatizing experience. I needed. Did you like, say, dude? I'm like ten years from middle age. Come on. Uh, you know I. I know I had the same uh, issue when I teach my course on therapeutic access to the older adult. Do you know what the most common question I get? Oh my God, I can't even imagine. Every single time, it's somebody a middle, like somebody in their mid sixties, raising their hand with this defiant look, like, "Who? What are you considering older adult?" I'm like, oh man, that is a loaded question. Yeah, I can't answer that You're right like, now. Like, whatever definition, sir, you want to use. Yeah, exactly. <laughs> I'll let you are classify you? yourself right yeah, now. You're older than that, you know. So. Yeah. Oh my God. Yeah. I was, There's uh, it. You know what has been interesting is a lot of athletes are starting to take much longer recovery periods. Um, like the most high profile one I can think of is Kevin Durant, right? Like he's taken the full season plus some off. Mm -hmm. Um, you know, I know an Achilles is usually like a year, but I mean, it'll be probably 18 months before he even really starts to push it a little bit. Um, uh, Steph Curry broke his hand and took like as extended periods of time off, even, even though it was just a bone break. Um, so you're starting to see athletes take much longer recovery periods. Do, do you do you think, and I'm adding on to your answer, Mike, and asking you, Brad, do you think a lot of that comes from the brain injury stuff where they're starting to see that you have to take a lot of time off to recover from concussions and it maybe is bleeding over? Um, I don't know if it's that or if it's more players have a little more control over their contracts and lives and okay. they get to dictate their terms of recovery and return to sport and they probably have insurance policies in their clauses yeah. that cover stuff and things like that. I think that's probably more of it. Okay. Well, I think a distinction is elite players. Yeah. Mm -hmm. I mean, if you're, if you're the seventh man on the squad, you know, you're probably pushing the envelope a lot more. If you're trying to make a mm -hmm. 60 person roster in the NFL, I think it's all relative to your, I mean, Steph Curry could sit out and, you know, a year because he's got a toothache, you know I mean? He can afford to do it and any team wouldn't, 
say boo about it. So yeah. I think that's that's a big part of it too. Hmm. Yeah, that's true. All right. Well, our last thing that you wanted to talk about, and we can we have a few minutes to briefly touch on, it, and that was why we should stop looking for the best best exercises for X Y Z injury. Yeah, yeah, I know that's a uh, that's a tricky thing because I see articles a lot like this, and I'm tempted to to you know to write them, and sometimes I have in the past. Uh, but that's a common question. You know, what's the best exercise for X Y Z? Um, very rarely um, is that's assuming that everything is solved with an exercise. Um, number one. Uh, number two, the best is usually context dependent. You know, um, what might be best for Brad is might not be a good idea for Jay. Um, and you, it's, I know that's not an answer people like. You want to get something simple, something clear. Um, but it's it's two big assumptions that are, are usually off. Sometimes the best solution is to stop doing something um, and do something else instead, as opposed to say, do these three exercises and that'll fix you know, um, trochanteric hip bursitis. Um, I kind of shake my head when I hear, you know, suggestions like that. So when you're looking to solve your own injuries, rather than saying what three or four best exercises to do, um, I instead say, you know, maybe I need to get evaluated to see what are, what habits I need to change, uh, what things I need to stop doing, what things I can, you know, uh, do proactively to prevent this or, or manage this better. Um, it's not always a list of five exercises. Perfect. So if you see a list of these are the things that you should do for X injury, just Run. close out of the browser and move on with your life. Let, let me put it to you in this simple analogy. If somebody told you, if you have kids and they said, these are the, the five things you need to do to get your kids smart. Nobody would look at that. They're like, are you kidding me? Like, these are the five books they need to read or the five things, you know, be like, well, my kids in second grade or my kids at MIT or, you know, we obviously know that's far more personalized. Yeah. Uh, I don't know why we expect the same from exercise. So you're telling me that me reading those Buzzfeed lists and giving, buying books off of them and giving them to my kid is not what I'm supposed to be doing. <laughs> oh man. I guess I, uh, I guess I hit the wrong analogy. For <laughs> <laughs> he called his teacher a communist yesterday. So I think we're batting up the right tree. Oh, oh yeah, all right. Uh, yeah, they made him read a new. They're reading a nutrition book in there, and it's uh, and some of the things in there we want we discussed, and some of the points are very valid. Some of them are not very valid. Um, like you should avoid like anything with any 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 food that has an ingredient you can't pronounce. You shouldn't eat. Mm -hmm. Um, and okay. I explained that's not true. You can eat them in moderation, and it said calories matter, but not in the ways we think for weight loss. And I said that's not true, and we went over things, went over the good things, and then they were discussing it during class. And the ten year old told his teacher, "I don't need your communist propaganda filling my head." And I'm like, "I didn't say that one. That one was oh, not me." Oh my god! Like, oh, <laughs> he did not get that from me. I don't know where that came from, but yeah, probably <laughs> some video game he was playing. I'm, no, I, I'm going to go with it. Was his grandfather? Well, uh, my daughter's reading Ayn Rand for her summer reading, so uh, maybe. Oh, what, what book? Anthem. Oh, that's a good book. Yeah. Real Atlas Shrugged is my favorite book of all time. I think I've read it about 15 times. Yeah, that's pretty meaty. You know, she's yeah. 14, so. I there's, think a, of, there's a, of, there's a of teenage the, version. I can send you the link to it. Is there? Oh, I love good. that. Yeah. yeah. I think of all the books I was forced to read in high school, I actually liked Anthem the most. <clears throat> Anthem's good. Yeah. That's it was cool. just interesting. Yeah, the order you should read them in for anybody listening is Anthem, Fountainhead, Atlas Shrug. The order they were released, but that's the order you should read them in because Atlas, everyone she builds on every single one throughout. The but what time. if I just want to watch a movie? Um, there is no, there's three Atlas Shrug movies in a trilogy to cover the 1600 page book, and they are progressively worse every single movie. I think the third one went straight to video. Hmm. That's not great. I mean, the main character in the, the the main protagonist in the movie is described as like having <clears throat> bright blonde hair and blue eyes, and they cast a guy with brown eyes and brown hair. So, and it was a big part of it. Like, oh, he had golden good. hair. Gold's a big theme in the movie and in the book, and they completely missed it. No, oh, that's not great. So, all right, that went off a little bit from nutrition. <laughs> but they, they 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 eat minimally processed food at the end of uh, Atlas Shrug because they live in the middle of nowhere. So oh. it works. There we go. Yeah, bring it full circle. Yeah. Boom. 
Yeah. And they're manual laborers, so they, you know, are physically fit. There you All go. Right. Perfect. So um, anybody have any closing comments or everybody good? Oh, somebody has a Stuart Martin, one of our moderators, had one comment. We'll get to that and then we'll take off. And he said, maybe a little off topic and probably more, <laughs> more physiological related. Just started take uh, taking the opportunity when minds oh, just oh just taking the opportunity when minds are together. Um, aside from your from your compounds, do you feel there are any legitimate isolation exercises specifically for the inner chest, or will focus more on the inner chest compared to others? I know we generally hear you cannot hit in isolation as it's not separate part of the chest muscle. Um, did everybody freeze? No, I'm good. Oh, Brad, no, it looks <laughs> like you guys both froze. You guys were both perfectly still, and I was so scared. I'm, I'm trying to read the question and like process it. <laughs> uh, well, he wrote it in English, English so none exercise. of us might understand it. I, I do not know the answer to this question. Doesn't, this is above my pay grade. Don't, oh, and I'm not. I, I don't want to be quoted on this, but I believe I can look it up. I believe that there was something I want to say it was by Schoenfeld, but I'm not positive. It was like standing single arm cable flies isolated the inner chest the most. Like if you were standing holding onto the pillar and coming out with this arm and going like this, it isolated the inside of that movement arm side of the chest. The but most. Doesn't, the, doesn't the whole muscle fiber have to contract? Like you don't it's just the whole thing does, but I believe it. it was like the it was like the best that results, but nothing did it in complete. I, I could be completely wrong, but that was if, if it's an EMG study, there's there's some problems with using EMG to you know quantify you know muscle activation, different parts mm -hmm. of the muscle. Um, I do think speaking of Schoenfeld, though, there were uh, there were studies showing like different parts of the hamstring could be targeted based on different movements. Um, I'm not sure if that applies to the pec or not, or um, you know what the application of that would be. But well, I just want to do target upper chest and just have big bands right here that are bigger than everywhere else. That's all I want. <laughs> okay. Yeah, that'd be the, that'd be the craziest look in the entire world just giant yeah, upper chest yeah yeah that'd be cool brad let's do that just an upper chest seven day a week workout program how about if i just do like uh synthol injections and call it good just in your upper chest yeah. yes yeah just that'd there. be sweet too right in the upper chest that seems like the safest place to Correct. do a synthol injection. i'm glad we're on the same page because i'm in uh, do you think that when like in in 600 years when they go to like dig up like famous bodybuilders skeletons and they examine them they'll just find big balls of plastic where their arm should be maybe i think that'd be could you we'll imagine doing like an autopsy on somebody and then you like cut open like what the hell why is there plastic in their arm <laughs> <laughs> what what will be really interesting is uh when they unearth us and they find like just pieces of metal and then they I, I'm guessing like silicone will degrade over time but like they're like oh these people just augmented their bodies with silicone to make different parts bigger or they think it's like a computer like based so like it's computer based oh my god why did they have big processors in their chests I don't know if it'll be quite like that but it may be but it'd be funny that would be <laughs> funny all right on that note we're out. So everybody have a great day. Mike, thank you as always for uh, joining us and uh, we will see you next time. Brad, where will we see them? When will we see them? At the same macro time. And, and where? On the same macro channel. Okay, there we go. All right, Brad, are you ready for your outro dance? Yep. All right, everybody have a good one. I'm, I'm not going to stop it. Mike, you can just see this in all of its glory <laughs> for right. what it's worth. And then you can you can talk about it next time you're here on how Jay, fantastic. Jay makes my dancing a much bigger deal than it actually I is. I see it three days a week, every day, every week for the past nine months. Hey, I'm just, I'm vibing. Yeah. All right. <laughs> Bye, guys.